Welcome to the Dr. Tom Show. Today, I'm very excited to have someone who I've admired for a long time uh, and got to know a little bit over the years. Um, and I've been a little bit cautious to invite him onto the show because I do hold him in such great esteem and I'm very grateful that he's actually said yes. As chiropractic moves into the neuro age, Dr. Fletcher is recognized as leading and championing this shift. He's the innovator of the Insight Technologies, placing him as an expert on the intersection between today's technologies and timeless principles of healing. He's the owner and the president of the Chiropractic Leadership Alliance, and his passion is in teaching success-based, principled strategies and certainty for an inspiring message of chiropractic today. So I'm really thrilled and very excited to have a good friend of mine, Dr. David Fletcher. Welcome to the show. Oh, Thomas, it's wonderful to be invited to such a show as yours. And, you know, to just uh, mirror what you said, uh, I've been an admirer of yours over the years. And uh, I can't tell you how happy I am to uh, spend the time with you and uh, share with what we know to be the truth of where chiropractic, but more importantly, personal health and freedoms really come together. I, I appreciate that. And it's nice that you talked on that because we are going to really open up a great conversation around chiropractic. And we spoke before the show, we have a broad audience, those who are in chiropractic and those who are outside of chiropractic. Um, there was a term we said there, neuro age. And I just want to ask you, what does that really mean for our audience listening? And then if we can get into you know, how we can use that to better our lives. Well, you know, as a chiropractor, I think that most of us are identified by the broad public as something to do with the spine. And of course, you know, there is, the, there is that absolute direct connection to the spine, but what people need to understand and what I think we as practitioners, but as the public needs to understand as well, is that this ability of us to be distinctively human and the ability of us to have this, this ideation and the capacity to be you know, creative and everything else isn't simply about structure. It's not even simply about function. It's about neural performance. And, you know, we have learned so much more in terms of the scientific research and the ability of experiential research to understand that the impact that we have from our, from our culture, from our environment and everything else interacts with the humanness of us directly at the neurological level. And so interestingly, if we're talking through the chiropractic lens, chiropractic has always been what I would describe as sort of the original profession of neuroplasticity, meaning that we always took it upon ourselves to believe in the greatness of, of mankind, humankind, because of our influence chiropractically on the nervous system and not the spine. And now is our age under which we can bring that forward, not only because of our intent, but because of the desire of the public to see the value of living fully, not simply living in fear of sickness and disease. And so if we had to pick one system, if we had to pick one part of the body that we could dedicate most of our interest for our health on, would it be on that nervous system, the brain and how it functions and communicates with the body? Yeah, I think that, I think there's no doubt about it is that, and you bring in the principle of the brain. And I think that if we were to function on a system, it would be wise to look first to the nervous system, because not only does it, does it create, you know, physiological function, organization and reorganization models in terms of tissues and cells and things of that nation notion, but it's that intersectional moment with mindfulness that brings health and, and humanness together. And that's why this interface of, uh, this is why I love chiropractic. You know, my background is in mathematics. And so I'm based upon the sense of logic. But the most logical approach, Tom, is to understand how we relate to our environment and to our, our, our communities. And to do that, chiropractic began its relationship with understanding obstructions to neurology, if you will. We described it in many different terms. We described it as the ability of the body to communicate a mental impulse, the, not the body, the person to create a mental impulse. Really, this is this whole idea of consciousness interacting through neurology and matter. And, you know, we've even got in, in our earliest philosophical modeling, something called a triune of life, and it was, you know, it wasn't a triune of physiological improvement. It was a triune of what it means to feel fully alive. And it was this, this, this concept of matter, which means that we had to live, you know, through a, with matter, that we had to have force, meaning that there had to be this 
this, this ability to communicate and to transmit. And then there was this notion of what are you transmitting and it's intelligence, meaning it wasn't confined to, you know, a, a, a signal in a nerve, but it was this idea of, of the um, modeling of this, this relationship of organizational design that could continuously re reinvent itself. And that's why I love chiropractic. And I, I agree with your sentiment there. And it, it is about expressing this wholeness. Like the big idea is, is the wholeness of life. Yeah. Um, and instead of trying to get incremental improvements on one thing or fix something that's wrong, it's, it's completely flipping that view and, and understanding of, of how we live on, on bettering ourselves totally, as opposed to fixing little things that might go a lot wrong along the way. Absolutely. And that's what, when I was coining the term, the neuro age, it was designed specifically to say, there is this coherence in all things and all systems, as you said, instead of little bits here and there. And really that's this, this notion that if you can find and, re and, and release an obstruction to this ability of the body to interpret itself in its environment and, and, and exceed expectations in that, in that task, then we have achieved this enormous lift if you would in the ability of that person to to move forward innately as we call it or not we call it but innately as the term implies from within and if you look at sort of our indigenous cultures north africa south america we we are living a whole and rounded and healthy life for a long time what what do you think is going wrong in in the western world where we are here in, in the uk and where you are in canada it's, it's chronic disease and and it's not just uh, Let's get away from that. It's just people just aren't living a full expression of their life. I mean, 30,000 days is a term I love to throw at people because that's the total amount of days that we have on planet Earth as an average. Mm -hmm. And if we're not expressing the fullness of each one of those, then they go by pretty quick. Why aren't we expressing the fullness? Like, is it because we aren't seeing chiropractors? Is it because we haven't chosen to assess the right thing? Where do you think people can even start to, to begin that? Great question. I, I think that it really, you know, it really is a two part answer. First off, there's the present. And the present exemplifies what I'll say is what my belief is as to why we become so distracted in the whole principle is the part of this part of the the mystery and the wisdom of understanding healing and otherwise is the complexity of the systems. And to most people, except for those that have taken time to learn through it, it's, a, it, it, it's so complex that they, the mind and the, the mind has to simplify things. And of course, the most simple way to, to understand health, the simplest way to understand health, and I'm not agreeing with this, is to acknowledge symptom is not healthy. Okay, so it's a very simply, simple binary process. I have symptoms and I don't understand it. So I need to find somebody who knows more about what it is that I have. And so there's this abdication of relationship between your body and your health. And this is, this is natural or normal because there is, this, there is this experience of something called pain, we'll call it over here because symptoms typically are a disassociation with who we are and it's painful. And one of the things that we know is that <clears throat> healing is not done by the hand of a healer. Healing is done by an association of an awakening of an awareness and an adaptability at a physiological level within the patient themselves, person, practice member, whatever you want to call them. And so the, the healer is somebody who has taken time to organize thinking to a higher level than they have so that they can dissipate the fear of what's in that patient. But in most cases, and this is where the world went wrong, is in most cases in the medical model, there was this idea of hierarchical dominance, which said, I know more than you do, you subjugate yourself to me, I'm going to put up structures called hospitals, and you need to come and die in a hospital, you know, you, you and, and along that path, we're going to do it. Yeah. And Western medicine, absolutely bought into that because it was a dominant process. There was this ability of, of control mechanisms. Everything in the Western world was all about control. 
And as a result of that, what we know now is that, and this is where this, this last two years has really brought out this fallacy that medicine has all the, all the answers. It's doing exactly, in my view anyways, what it is designed to do, which is be a heroic savior model for when people have lost their path. But the world, Tom, is searching to find this awakening within themselves to say, what can I do because I can't rely on this hierarchical system any longer? And what's interesting, and you know, you, you sort of introduced me in this, in this idea of, of what my role is now beyond being a clinical practitioner, is that I run this company that associates with, with measuring these obstructions within the nervous system, or at least this signaling within the nervous system. And so we have a vast network of, of chiropractors who work with us worldwide. And we did a smart thing about six years ago is that we decided that we would take all the data from all of those thousands of offices and put them into a central server base so we could then review the data. And what I find fascinating is that our brand of neuroage based practitioners is massively thriving in the past two years. The, 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 the number of new visits, the number of new patients, the number of, of retention-based examinations and everything else, which is data that I collect, is doing a hockey stick. And that doesn't tell me that chiropractic is any different than it was two years ago. It tells me that the public is different than it was two years ago. There is this great desire for people to find out how to mitigate the fear that we just talked about of not having ownership of your own health. Wow, was that a long answer? I'm sorry about that. It was that. a great answer. You saw me taking notes while I was doing that. And <laughs> a couple of things came to mind, which really is interesting. I think similar to what you said that people are looking for permission. They're looking for permission to take care of their own health. And I think yes. chiropractors give them that. A question I always ask patients, there's only one person in here who's gonna get you better, who is it? And they all say themselves, they all know innately where it comes from but i suppose they need that permission to do that and you say that this whole thing is complex and the human body is complex and then we talk about systems and this hierarchy comes in i think it's complex when we lack the trust in our body to do it itself but when we have that trust and that permission it's it's beautifully simple um if we can remove the interference well, I think we, I think, you know, you use the word trust and I think we need to, to look at the opportunity to break down the derivation of the word trust. It comes from the concept of truth. Mm -hmm. When you are, when you understand the truth of a concept, you can then have confidence and, and trust in it. And so the very first thing we need to do is, is, is shift the perspective about the truth of what happens within the human experience when it comes to health anyways. And that is, and here's the very simple truth that we as chiropractors have promoted is that the body, these are truths, is that the, the body is self-regulating, no question. Mm -hmm. That the body is self-healing, meaning that it reorganizes itself spontaneously, and that the control mechanisms of the first two of, of, of healing and regulation are under the guidance of the central nervous system. Those are your three parameters of truth. And if we could just I mean, it's very, you know, that's very boring. It's not really flowery that says, you know, you know, you know, a higher power comes in and it vivifies you. We can all live in that concept, but physiologically, those are truths that are measurable and defensible and everything else. So ergo, if you do deductive logic on it, if you have an obstruction into the control mechanisms that are in place in the neurology, then self-healing and self-regulation diminish. So wouldn't it make sense that if you can observe and reorganize the thinking in patients to have a newfound desire to understand the central nervous system as it's working in their favor, instead of being, an ad, being their adversary of pain and everything else, what if we were to try and re teach people to reorganize how their nervous system was interpreting itself, adapting? and then reorganize their perceptions as to what they can do to organize their reorganizational models. I mean, it's so simple and so elegant and so applicable. I agree. And, it's, it, and like you said earlier, it's timeless principles. It's stuff that we have known and been doing for a long time. Uh, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about heart rate variability because that's, sure. that's a great way of 
of measure of, well i believe and you are the expert on this of being measuring how a body is adapting to its environment how it is coping um and i like to think of it as the the truest test that i do is to someone's mm -hmm. health um and you may have other ideas but could you explain what heart rate variability is uh yeah there may be a lay person listening and then how we can use that to understand how we are functioning absolutely it's very simple to, to for everyone to understand is that the most important word that they can take away from the next part of the conversation is the principle of coherence and coherence means that there is ease within a system now i'll, I'll do a very simple thing that um the beating heart is actually a rhythmic control mechanism, not only for pumping blood, but for multiple systems within our body. And we could go way down a path on that way, but to very simplify, to, to, to understand this, is that if we can take the rate and rhythms of the beating heart and understand the, the neurological connections that control it, we can get an absolute inward picture of how much stress the body is constantly managing and whether or not that stress has become the new normal for that person. Now that's huge because if a person has, a, has maladapted, if you will, to become the adapted maladaptive person, which is the new normal, that means that they are living in a constant, and I'll use this term again, physiological fearful place meaning that their body is always on edge and it drains their natural resources. So let me, let me do this for the layperson especially. So the beating heart has two mechanisms, one that speeds it up and one that allows it to regulate or slow it down, if you will, or keep it in check. So when there is a dynamic fear that comes into our body, we produce a adrenaline, everybody has experienced this, their heart beats faster, and we call that the fight flight response. And it's subtle until it's not, it's, it's like, a, you know, like a freight train going through if it needs to be that way. But to slow down that so we don't live in that state all the time, the body produces a different balancing act, which is something that is controlled by a brain-based nerve called the vagus nerve, and it naturally controls that. Now, a little wrinkle in all of this is, is that we, we naturally are just a little bit on the fight flight side all the time. And that's good because it means that we are always ready to take care of ourselves. That's, that's the, the body's way of sort of saying, I'm on guard. And so there's a natural tendency to be just a little bit more what we call fight flight active or sympathetic dominant. And so there is a great necessity for this tone within the balancing act of the vagal nerve to constantly be firing to assure that that, that balance is held in check. Here's what happens, is that two things are at play at all times in this humanness, is that if a person doesn't learn to rest and, and recover properly, whether it's from over-exercise or bad relationships or traumas or anything else that goes along with this bad eating, they constantly turn on the circuits so that they're sympathetically dominant all the time. And that fatigues the central nervous system. But there's another dimension that's in there, is that that vagal nerve has to traverse from the brain down through the spine to get to the heart and to all the other mechanisms within the body that it controls. And so there are intersectional moments of where this literal physical activity of the nerve is traversing and it is subjected to mechanical forces within the spine. And so chiropractors have devised very, very specific approaches called adjustments, which not only identify, but release that, that neural tension of especially the vagal nerve. But it isn't as simple as a wiring harness because nerves produce neurotransmitters and neurotransmitters are chemicals which, which affect and are generated through all different mechanisms within our body. And so when a chiropractor works in different regions of the spine and stimulates or removes obstructions or blocks nauseous input to the spine and the brain, these neural mechanisms, these are the complexities we talked about, 
are altering this balance between this, this control mechanism of fight flight and this control mechanism of rest and digest and restoration. So by using heart rate variability, which is the most observable test of this natural adaptive response, we can understand a set point as to exactly where a person's life is at. Are they overextending themselves? Are they exhausted? Are they trying to, are they trying to live their life with their foot on the brake? Or are they living their life with their foot on the gas pedal? Are they finding a way to, to find that ease or coherence by the choices they make? And the last thing I'll say, Tom, in this, in this, this model, is that here's the most magnificent part about HRV, heart rate variability, when it comes to chiropractic. Chiropractic works. When you adjust a spinal distortion that affects the neurology through, the, through a vertebral subluxation and through a, a spinal adjustment, there are study after study after study that indicate that two things happen, is that there is a natural recovery of the balance in that neurology, and there is an elevation in the activity of the nervous system so that it builds a reserve. Now, who wouldn't want to know that in COVID times or otherwise? Mm. Absolutely. And it, it, it does show with, you know, just anecdotal evidence that we have you know, in our practices. We see the change. We, we observe it. Even, even chiropractors, they're not getting sick. You know, the oh. majority of them. <laughs> uh, um, so with, with heart, ver heart rate variability and with the adjustment, can one overstimulate a body with adjustment? and therefore put it in that fight and flight mode um, if done incorrectly? Well, I think, that, I think that the term adjustment is the key here. And I think that if you transfer the principle of an adjustment, which is a very specific input with one intention, and that's to release, you know, it stimulates in, in some ways. And, you know, if we have the time, I'll talk about this, this modeling of, uh, of neuroplasticity, because this answers the question, is, you know, neurons that wire together, fire together. So there's this sense of improvement that goes along with that. But there is also this idea that neurons that don't fire together continue to fire against one another. Okay. So there is a great leveling act. If you impart an adjustment, it is natural for that body to interpret that as a, uh, interpret it, and then use it to, with this new set harmonics and tone within the nervous system, use that to rewire those neurons. In the concept of neuroplasticity, there are two principles that make it work, time and repetition. It's unlikely, this is the answer to your question, it's unlikely that you can overstimulate the nervous system because the nervous system is wired to interpret and learn. And in this particular case, the more the merrier. And this is why, you know, we talked about how there's this desire for people to learn how to take care of themselves. One part of that is understanding the mechanism of what's causing obstructions and making lifestyle shifts and whatever else. But the other side of that is re-engaging this plastic notion within the nervous system through time and repetition. One of, the, one of the things that I see mostly within chiropractic practices is an under-management. This answers your question, I think, is an under-management of a patient's care plan because they fall back into the how are you or they make a decision on, on, on what the care should be. Some of the greatest practitioners, you know, from, from the founders and forward, were very clear with it is that the more input you have, the faster the body reorganizes itself. And so if we are serious about making people's neurology reorganize and become more plastic and capable, then more is better. Yeah. Not for always, because we have to hand it off. It's like parenting, right, Tom? I mean, you can't always do it for someone else. You have to hand it off and make sure that they get it. 
And so we would love it if we could get this rocket off the ground, which, you know, I think it takes, what is it, 96% of a rocket's fuel to move it the first one foot off the launch pad. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes time at that initial process. But once we get this thing navigating itself, hey, let me slip and check. Let yeah. me make sure you're doing where your navigation is. Well, the laws of inertia are just you know, natural physics, aren't they? It takes time, it yeah. takes effort to get something moving. Um, but also, I suppose, I suppose for, for the chiropractors listening, it, it's having a sound understanding of our philosophy that, that we are adjusting the body and getting out of the way. We're not trying to force that change. We're not trying to you know, be the hero for the system. We, we are simply removing an interference and, and allowing the body to do what it needs. Yeah, and I think that this really draws the attention to the distinction between what our colleges are teaching and otherwise. You know, um, when when you and I were choosing to be chiropractors, we were we were learning, or you know, we we taken ourselves in this path of where we know the distinction between an adjustment and a spinal manipulative therapy. You know, it's intentful, yes, but it's 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 actually based upon the art and the of the detection and and the adjusting correction, if you will. A, an SMT has a purpose of managing a fixation within the motion within the spine. Mm -hmm. And the logic behind that is that at a neurological level is that the proprioception that's associated with those, those you know, firing sequences in the posterior joints allows the brain to have this, this Melzack and Wall gating system and the outcome is pain and movement management, okay? An adjustment is designed to tune or reset the tone within the proper functioning of the nervous system so we don't look simply at the cavitation of a joint in the spine to affect as i said with the smt we look at like you said the heart rate variability of the patient we look at their adaptive responsiveness we look at the tone of the functioning nervous system and understand that person's in a better place to get that triune of life going and i think that's exactly where people want to be that's what like you said at the top of the show, that's what human beings are looking for. That's what cultures and communities want. Um, you know, there is a shift in age and a, an, an awakening of understanding who we are as humans and how we are meant to heal and not being forced to, to take on anything or um, trying to say this without getting myself in murky water, <laughs> <laughs> wanting to get back to our roots of innate healing and health. And I think chiropractors really are in a place to champion that. And um Certainly what you do helps not only hundreds, thousands of chiropractors worldwide, you know, but tens of thousands of patients as a result of that. And you should be, you know, noted for that. And you should take that, you know, to heart and understand that you are making a huge difference in this world. And I am appreciative of you for doing that. If, um, if you could leave our audience with some parting words of wisdom about how they could maybe speak to the chiropractor first and then maybe speak to, to the lay person afterwards as to what they can do to improve themselves, their practice uh, and their lives. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think that, you know, directed to both, uh, both cohorts of, of people there um, the key word, which is why chiropractic is so special is that um, it begins with the principle of greatness. You know um, our major premise says a universal intelligence is those first four words really describe the sense that there is this greatness within each and every one of us. And what chiropractic has done is that it has spent its not only philosophical time but its art forms and it you know redirected its science into understanding how to express this greatness and in doing so. The starting point is, is based on what, Tom, you said, which was to embrace this concept of trust. And I think that a parting comment would be that to a chiropractor is trust that you have chosen this amazing profession to describe your arts and talents to the benefit of mankind, not just simply, we know that a well-adjusted person makes better decisions. And that well-adjusted person creates a ripple effect in their community, family-based and everything else. By adjusting one person and putting them on the right path, there is a better society that comes from it. And I think that everybody has to realize that we're so connected through, through every form of it. And if there's anything that the societal chaos has shown us in COVID is that there is an interaction between a person's health and the way society functions. 
And, you know, and, and I won't go into judgment or anything else with this, but the truth is we can look at it as a grand experiment. Chiropractors have this amazing opportunity to have a conversation, to deliver an adjustment to a society that needs a shift to give them that trust and that hope at this time more than ever. Thank you. And, and if people want to find out more about you, get more information from what you do, where can they go to find that out? Um, you know, I'm on Instagram and uh, Doc Fletch uh, CLA, I think. I think that's what it is. I never <laughs> go on there, but my team tells me that's where I am. But, you know, I think one of the things that uh, from a chiropractic perspective and, and, and the lay public is more than welcome to understand technologies that we deliver. Um, we operate under what is known as Insight, which is that looking in or the InsightCLA.com. And, um, you know, we, we, we'd always entertain more chiropractors to open up a conversation with us. And that way you can have a remarkable time with your patients. Dr. David, thank you very much for taking your time to join us on the show. I know it's early over there in, in Canada, um, but we appreciate you carving out the time. And I've learned so much today. I've taken notes and I know the audience listening uh, have learned a lot. Um, and we'll put this into the timeless ether for thousands of people to, uh, to listen to in the future. So, Dr. David, thank you very much uh, for joining us on the show. Dr. Tom, thank you so much for doing what you do. And thank you for inviting me onto this show. Pleasure.